So here's my question for you. Okay. Bulletin is the first meteorological startup in Turkey based on a machine learning project that was started in 2016 and formally launched in January 2021, so pretty recently. And you've grown very quickly. You have a team of 25, 15 meteorologists. And within the first six months, you had nine paying clients and were generating cash flow. How many of you startups would like to have that scenario? So what was the strategic approach that you took? How did you determine which sectors to focus on, which customers to prioritize? for the loud intro. Uh, I hope I can respond to this. Uh, hello, my name is Gökhan. I'm the co-founder and the sports person of 25 people. Uh, saying hello to everyone. Can you do that? Can you do Hello, my name is Gökhan. Uh, I'm the, the sports person and the co-founder of Bulutba. Uh, a team of 25 saying hello to everyone in Istanbul. Uh, as Renita uh, well said, or is that maybe? <laughs> uh, we deal with four elements of nature, uh, one of the four elements of nature uh, earth, soil, earth, water, fire, and air. We deal with air. Air is simply the mixture of gases in the atmosphere. <coughs> Weather is the particle place, and the particle place, the particle fire, the steps of atmosphere. So imagine that as a human being or as a business, imagine that you are just trying to correct some use cases. You know, breathe in and you breathe out air. You just drive a car, you just hit the particles. You run a wind farm, you need wind to turn the wheels. So come up with a sector and I'll come uh, I'll be at least three use cases for each and every sector. And that's what we have. Start. We just lined up uh, all of the sectors that we can think of, like let's say 10 main sectors, and we have identified 40 to 50 uh, use cases each and for each and every sector, and we have prioritized uh, in a strategic way. Let's say. But before that, uh, we are uh, just to uh, depict what we are doing. We have a uh, an AI-based. Prediction engine that is our own, and we make the precise and the local predictions in Turkey. If not only, if not the first one, or if not the only one, one of the let's say uh, one of the pioneering ones in Turkey. And we start from scratch. As, as I said, we just lined up the use cases so that we can we can work on, and uh, we 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 analyze the sectors in a way that. We can make a prioritization in terms of technology adaptation in the, in the sector because you need to break down the science into actionable insights rather than giving two sides to any sector because it's something. Mm -hmm. and secondly, we have identified now some cross sectoral products that can uh, catalyze the cross sectoral uh, transformation, otherwise, transformation in terms of. And we all know, uh, just to intro, uh, we don't believe in global standards, we believe in global standards. I and mean, there is no such thing as a standard that you can't be global without having a global team. These are the two main things that we have identified from day one. We have hired our global team members in the month of six, six, six months of the company uh, start, and we have gained our first ever customer in the sixth month as well. So there is no, my, my highlight for the round is there is no Turkey standard, there is only global standard and uh, there is no way, at least to the best of my knowledge, there is no way to make a global team without having a, making a global business without having a global team. That's a really smart point, right? Instead of starting regional, you started global from the beginning, which I imagine took more thinking and strategy, but it will, it will, it will buy speed in the, in the long run. Thank you. Uh, next we have Batur. Batur Erdogan. 30 years of technology. 30 years of technology experience, both in, in the corporate world, uh, Siemens, and entrepreneurship. And when he was 26, he launched Turkey's first internet portal. 
and web design agency, and currently he's the CEO of TEG, which is Technology Development Group, providing a range of technology solutions, including consultants, the usual suspects, right? System integration, managed services. Um, so my question for you, Victor, is you're an ideas guy. You have all these patents and sales automation. But as we all know, great ideas are not enough. So what have you learned about developing prototypes and launching new products and services and identifying the customer demand? Um, and what's a recent example of how that works in practice? Thank you, Randy. Uh, I will uh, give two examples. Please. Uh, two stories about my previous experience. And, uh, yes, you are right. I have many ideas. I have uh, ideas, no, I can say, hundreds of ideas with me. Uh, some of them is implemented last for 30 years. Some of them is still in, uh, in the world. Uh, I would like to talk about the, uh, one example, Easy, Easy Carrier, which is a robot, in it. autonomous robot. It's a carry devices and spare parts in the factories uh, with all you know with the automation from one point to other point uh, we started this project uh, several years ago indeed but uh, what I learned from my experience uh, to make your idea or your project uh, happen reality and get some profit. You have to talk and uh, convince your customers first. Yes. Uh, because creating ideas is, is an easy task, at least for myself. But make it happen is you have to convince someone else around the world as a customer who someone has to pay for it. And is it is the one of the examples? We started the discussions about the idea of the EC several years ago and we wrote documents and presentations first to convince ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we started to talk with the customers, clients, candidates, and discussing with them their feedback, updated documents, and so on and so forth. At some point, one of the customers decided to make some signature for it, and that's what we did. We started to develop and uh, we developed a prototype and now it's somehow it's working still in my opinion it's prototyping but okay it's working now in some of the factory and that can be used in the retailer department stores in the bay houses in, in the following five ten years i'm sure so just to clarify you had the idea you took it to the customer yep. and you got a contract yes exactly and then to build yes. This is different than the uh, the other startups. I can say uh, that generally, uh, if some entrepreneur have an idea and try to make it some prototype and make it happen and spending some money, yes, and time. And if you couldn't convince the enough number of customers, you are losing your base. And, uh, the, the project is uh, going down. I can I can see. Uh, that's why I strongly uh, suggest all of the entrepreneurs and investors, you can choose the way, if you can, create idea, convince your customer first, and then make your investment. Yes, I've seen lots of startups fail because they didn't do that. Exactly. I have another example. I would like to share the stories. It, it is uh, also important, I, I, I think. I'm also interested in society benefit projects last uh, 10 to 15 years. And uh, all we know, uh, last five to 10 years, uh, we are living in the, one of the worst years of report for natural disasters. So, uh, governments and uh, strain relief organization, because they all come in and say they attempt to rebuild this, this catastrophic environment. Uh, in the wake of this global catastrophe, we as TTG, my organization, uh, decided to formalize a quarter in action initiative. It's uh, some uh, sort of uh, competition event for the entrepreneurs or for the students especially. Uh, 
and color in action is uh, basically focusing on the earthquakes and climate change, pandemic, tsunami, overflows, pollution, something like that. And uh, since today's event is about somehow earthquake, I would like to give the example of the, uh, the earthquake projects, what we did uh, two years ago. In 2021, the subject of water action uh, was uh, earthquake, and around 20 people and teams uh, applied to this event, and we selected two of them two of them uh, as a winner uh, to those applicants. And the winner, the first one uh, name was Zazera 1.0. Zazera 1.0 was developed by the Idris and the Mustafa Karola, who are students in Osmani University. Uh, maybe you know Osmani is one of the affected cities in February earthquake in Turkey just uh, six months ago. And 65% of the city was destroyed and it is uh, our dinner uh, was affected as well. And uh, his apartment got injured and he lost some relatives and friends uh, in the city. And he had to move uh, from the city to Istanbul first and then go through. And then Kayseri, and uh, he, could, he couldn't manage to leave other cities, and uh, he uh, went back to his own uh, home city, Osmani, again, same apartment, and he is living in that nowadays. And his project, Zazel 1.0, contains two different devices. One of them is settled down in the building, in the apartment. And the second one is the outside of the apartment. And they are transmitting information about the earthquake. And uh, if you are asking the, what it is providing to outside of the rank, I will write it down the uh, How strong the earthquake is occurred, and how many seconds of earthquake is occurred, it is sending the outside of the world, and geolocation of cells and devices, and uh, how many new or dead bodies under the rack it's giving this information. And with a sensitive microphone, it records and sends all sounds in the building outside. And also with powerful speakers, rescue teams can send their voice to the victims under the building's rack. Um, after the coder in action achievement of Zelzela 1.0, uh, Idris, he contacted with the Turkish government uh, agencies and they continue to test and evaluate the products and the projects still. Uh, but I'm sure the project and the product was somehow elevated and it's going to be used in, in life. Thank you. So my understanding is that you want to use this program, coder in action, yes. as a prototype itself to help governments, organizations develop their own innovation competitions so they can find these very innovative stories. I am the customer side of this. I paid something to him mm -hmm. and he started to make it happen after this. Yes. And in 20 seconds. And the first example was I, I am the salesman, in the second yeah. one, the end, I can say this. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> So Victor, Victor Salvia is CEO and founder of BrokerWare, brokerage and wealth management software for capital markets. He also has a PhD in bioinformatics where he did research on the human genome and DNA. So when it comes to science-based tech companies, they're often said to be SISP, solution in search of a problem. And so one of the most important aspects in finding market alignment is timing. And whether it's macro events, like natural disasters, uh, market trends, consumer mindsets. And you have this interesting story that illustrates the importance of timing. Could you share, Victor?
Yeah. Yeah. So I guess. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess the the idea of this panel is to sort of why start succeed or fail in the long run. So um, when you start to think about that, um, it's, it's good to to separate it in its particular components. So first, you, you can have the, the idea, for example, and how your your idea is, is good to, to the market. You see somebody there that wants to buy the product or service that you want to sell. Can I have myself some failures? And I have myself some failures about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of founders have done something that in, in their head it was a good product or service, but in the long run nobody wants to, to buy it, so you spend a lot of money, a lot of time, and then you realize that, that it, wasn't, it wasn't that really good for the market. But then, then you have the team, for example, and, and, and team is execution. How good is your team for, for getting that idea into action? Uh, how good is to be adapted to new situations? How good is to build when the when, when environment changes? You can have the business model. Uh, how, good, how good is your business model? Is it that like what, what you want to, to sell? Is it in the right price? Is it somebody who's willing to pay for that? Maybe mm -hmm. willing to have it, but is not willing to pay for it. Uh, then you can have the funding. Do you have the right funding to, to cross the, the first step of, of uh, your, your startup from scratch into having your first line and your traction? You have enough money to do that. You have enough funding. And, and then it's time also because if you can be early to the market and then uh, you have to make your clients uh, know how to use your product or the reason for your meaning to that. You can be just in time to the market, but you could be late to the market and you will have many competitors. But then, um, Bill Ross, who is uh, an, an entrepreneur and, and, and founder of the idea that he creates more than 100 companies, he, he made uh, an analysis, a, a, a research about 200 companies, and he's, he found out that uh, timing was. Uh, the most important thing, 42% of the, the you you I'm sure it, you, you always have to have all all the yes, yeah. all the aspects. You have to have a good idea, a good team, a good bit. Without the timing, but timing is, is the most important thing. You find out. So uh, I have this story uh, that happened to a biotech company in Uruguay. It was a small country, 3.5 million people only. Um, so the market is very tiny. Um, the, the, in this biotech company, they, they, they were building um, test kits for, for several diseases and, and uh, genetic conditions. And they, were, they, they all came from the academia, uh, I know um, most of the founders. Um, after many years of, of, of being in the market, they, they, they were struggling to survive because uh, they had a highly skilled team. They have a nice facility for, for doing all the stuff they were doing. Uh, their scientific level was the level was, was brilliant. And, and they have developed their own kits, but not only their own kits, but kits, but because of the, the, the poor money they have, they have to also invent the reactive for their kits. So um, in 2020 when, when when COVID strike the wall, they start preparing their, their kit for that, and they, they, they were connected with the Institute but sir, Most of them, they have second job that they the so they, they know that COVID was coming. Uh, but when, when COVID strike our country, it was the only uh, laboratory with capabilities of, of doing the test. And, and they have uh, uh, um, a major influence and, and how the pandemic trans transcourse over, over the, the several years. So they, they, they went from 13 people to more than 400 people in wow. like, like uh, six months. 
and they went from a company that, that made uh, 5,000 tests in, in one year to make more than 8,000 in one day. <laughs> wow. So it, it, it was like, like an explosion. That's a scaling. Yeah. But it, it, that, that could only happen because they, they already have the, the technology, they already have the, the processes, they already have the people to do that, to train. And they, they, they've already made not only the test, but the reactive for the test. So they don't need to import them from China or whatever. They, wow. they, they could come up from, from uh, alcohol and, and, and more, more, more available stuff. So the full the, process yeah. for testing. Yes. So I guess it's, uh, it's, um, it's a story that, that marks some, something that Talent calls anti fragility that is the, the capability of exactly. to adapt into new things and, and take profit out of that. You know, yeah. Like being being able you know, to stood up to, to the to the problem and grow up on that. Yes. Because my understanding is they were founded in two thousand one. Yes. So they'd been around for twenty years, yes. but somewhat struggling. They weren't really thriving, you said. Yes. Yes, because of the market size, you know, that you can have the best technology, but if you implement it in a 3.5 million country, that you, you don't have that. Right. So, uh, uh, and then came something that created a much bigger market yeah. right there exactly. and changed everything. Thank you. That's an excellent story of timing I've ever heard about. All right. Uh, Yoko Avenai. Uh, is a serial entrepreneur, co-founder of Grow VC Group, and a pioneer in digital finance, fintech, and data analytics solutions. He's led digital disruption in finance as an advisor in the EU and Asia, and as well as in the US, helping to allow the Jobs Act. So now we're going to go more to the corporate side. Uh, let's talk about why commercial product management is so critical um, you were at Nokia back in the late 90s when it was the best-selling mobile phone brand. And Nokia had developed the technology for number portability, so being able to take your number to any operator. And they wanted to sell it globally, but nobody wanted to buy it. So Yoko here was hired to be the commercial product manager. So tell us, what was the role you played, and why was it important? Um. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I can tell it very briefly. It's a very old story, and uh, I, I think that I can then talk more about what's seen with startups. But ba basically, yeah, the Nokia time was a kind of university for me for the product management and what I call commercial product management. And I think that the, it was very traditional problem that there were some engineer teams that had developed certain solutions and then basically they thought that everybody wanted to get to that kind of solution. And, and then we basically, when I started there, we took very different approaches that we basically went around the world to meet different customers and basically to learn that what is their situation, what is their existing technology, how they can apply this new solution. And, and also, uh, there are many kinds of things, not, on, not always only commercial, but there might be some reasons that are linked to competition, sometimes even for the politics and that, that kind of thing, so that you, you need to understand the customer needs. And a kind of additional point is that uh, your solution must be a full solution for something. And I think that what is often a problem with many technologies solutions and platforms is that they can offer components for a solution, but they cannot really solve the full problem a certain client needs. And I, I think that it, 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 is, it is one key point from there. And if, if I go to these all startups I have been involved, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, I have worked especially with the data science, uh, data analytics, like Everybody say AI nowadays, I, I hate the word because it is so diluted. Uh, but, but, but anyway, I have had also a lot of doctors in my companies, data scientists, mathematics, physics, so on. I have had many fights with them uh, when, when, 
when they say that okay, this solution is not perfect, but at the, at the same time there is the customer needs that might be something that they don't need the full or they don't need perfect uh, technology, but they need a solution for their needs. And uh, uh, then there are always also a kind of aspects that how you get people to understand something. And this is my own uh, rule of thumb that you must have enough old and enough new when you start to sell something new. And, and my rule of thumb actually come from one of my first startups where we make data analytics, uh, especially for the marketing and advertising. And it was a little bit hard to sell first. But then we actually developed the concept what we call three-dimensional customer analytics. And we thought that most of the companies have two dimensions. One is demographics, that is basically to analyze that how all customers who have, where they live, what are they income, and these kind of things. That many, many companies basically analyze those things about their customers. Then there is also behavior analytics, like for example, what people are doing on websites and so on, so that that exists also in many companies. And then, what we had unique was uh, social network analytics, how people are connecting to each other, how they influence on each other. And then we basically made the kind of sales material that we have this three-dimensional customer analytics, that you probably have these two, two dimensions, but we are the only one to offer the third dimension. And it actually started to work very well. And I would say that uh, one reason was that they were enough of those components that these buyers understood and they, they had experience and then there was something new. And, and that has been my rule of thumb, not very scientific, that when you offer something new, maybe you must have two-thirds something what people know and understand earlier and then one-third something new that they feel that they can expand their existing solution or experience. But of course, just one more point is that the customer need is very complex thing also. It's, it's very simple to say that, okay, you must solve customer need or customer problem. But then there are of course situations that customers don't know what they want and what is also important that it's not the same thing what customers want to get and what they are ready to pay for. And it's actually very important that I, 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 I don't mean that uh, money is the most important part, but, but it is a kind of matrix that company or person must be ready to pay something for your product or service. Otherwise, they don't even take it seriously. And I, I have seen it that, for example, one of my company, my finance platform, we wanted to make something good in Africa. We wanted to offer a kind of finance platform together with the World Bank. But it didn't work because everybody just made all these things for free. And, uh, and, and there, were, there were no real motivation uh, to do things. But, but the customer need is, is it's a really complex thing. Uh, we will hear very soon about quantum computing. And if you go to the street and ask that how many people want to buy a quantum computer, mm -hmm. so that I would say that it doesn't work in that way, that sometimes you must also make new things, uh, but, but then to get to the market, you, you need these uh, real use cases that somebody is able to use it or something. But at the same time, it's very risky also to think that all companies work in the same way because the, the reality is that there are also companies that use hundreds of millions or even billions of money until they have anything ready to market. So, so that in that way to say that you must always find first some people who are ready to pay for your product immediately. It's not case for all startups, it's case for many small businesses, but, but uh, it's also risky if people think that there is only one model to do. Thank you. So, thank you. You have touched on so many of those human elements that I mentioned 
that are required in bringing technologies to market. It's not the best technology that wins. So first of all, you have to present it in a way that it's not completely new. I, I like your formula, 60% uh, or so sort of familiar with 30% new so that they can kind of accept it. Um, and then the idea of working with the actual technologists and not having the technology to be perfect, right? How often does that slow things down? And then finally, what I've seen, I write about corporate and startup collaborations. And the ones that are the most successful that I've seen are the ones where the corporates are really invested from the beginning. They're not just writing a check and saying, bring me a finished product. They're involved from the beginning with the, the development of the prototype and, and, and customizing the technology. And like you say, it shows their commitment and their motivation. Yeah, and if I can add my very personal uh, comment that is maybe a little bit strong opinion, but the first part for the startups is to talk with innovation people of the corporations because they can typically kill all innovations. <laughs> oh dear. Thank you. So, um, to the audience, I'm going to actually open it up to questions after we go around to all the panels. So, you can be thinking about something you might like to ask what you've heard about, what you've heard of. So yes, let's go to Kuan Yin, uh, co-founder and CTO of IQM, Quantum Computers, where he leads a team of over 100 physicists, scientists, and engineers. That must be fun. Um, previously, he worked as an academic research fellow in QCD Labs at L2, <coughs> excuse me, University, and in Microsoft as a senior research scientist. He has more than 15 years of experience working in fields of quantum computing, ranging from spin qubits to superconducting qubits. So, Kuan Yin, as a deep tech company, there are some real growing pains in making the transition from an R&D project-based uh, focus to a more productized focus, which is where IQM is now, scaling. And <clears throat> you have to align what potential customers need with what solutions your te technology can actually provide. Right? And, and then build the trust that you can actually deliver it. So how have these challenges played out or how are they playing out in IQM as you're making this transition to scaling? Yeah, thanks a lot, Manita, for a very nice introduction. I have to say that, um, yeah, there are a lot of challenges, as you know, like um, trying to sell blue sky technology. Um, so basically what you do is actually selling the future to the people, right? And, and for IQM as a, as a startup company, we started back in 2019, just before the pandemic, uh, started operations. And then we have our very first uh, order, which is uh, sort of from the government uh, to buy a quantum computer in Finland. I think that's quite visionary from, from, the, from the government side uh, to basically have it delivered in the, in the next three to four years. So it's really a long-term project. The issue is that the VVC initially was that the government doesn't know what they're buying, as, as you mentioned. They don't know what they're going to get. They know it's very expensive. They know it's coming and it's going to be very important for the engines of tomorrow's economy. Um, so, and they don't know anything about the company. We are a young startup, 20 people, uh, doing everything ourselves, a lot of engineers. Um, and the, the thing is that what we see is that, you know, uh, trying to get the government to even think about uh, quantum computer is that you need to get them to really understand the technology, educate the government that okay, quantum computing is something that's very important. And if they don't know, uh, what will happen is that they would start asking questions. Mm -hmm. And typically for a deep tech te technology like quantum, they will ask ac academ academia, right? The academics will start um, you know, saying if this is like, a good idea or not. Uh, apart from that, you also need uh, the end users. So let's say if you build a quantum computer, it's like tens of millions of euros. Who's going to use it? Is it going to generate any value for the, for the you know, society? So what we did initially was to realize that, okay, at the very minimum, you need to align all of them. You need to align these three so-called pillars to make sure that they are saying yes. Okay, we need to get this technology. Not saying yes to IQF, but just saying yes. <laughs> And then, of course, as government funding comes, it's it's um, it's always a public tender. So you also have to show that you have the capabilities to win the tender. So we have to go through all these processes. 
we don't have a tender, a, a, a expert tender team that can, can write the tender, so we have to use engineers to do everything. We have to use engineers to go to the government, to actually educate the government what quantum computing is. And we also need to use engineers to go to the industry to tell uh, people, okay, what you can actually use a quantum computer for. So uh, we have to set up a lot of uh, like, uh, institutions, like, for example, like the, the groups of business people working in quantum, Nokia, joint initially, which put a lot of uh, momentum to the whole initiative. We have a institute queue where we have all the uh, universities in Finland and some outside of Finland to actually be in there to say, okay, quantum computing is coming, how do we actually productize this, this technology? And so that was the biggest uh, thing that was going on. And then after that, of course, uh, we have then the engineers coming back to the lab, start developing the technology, building the technology, they would, like Yoko mentioned, exactly develop all the features that probably people don't even need. <laughs> and then they would uh, start to do everything. So you need to manage those teams and make sure that, you know, time to market is very important. You don't have to keep on developing to 100% uh, satisfaction, right? So 90% is good enough. And just go to the market and start you know, fixing problems as they come up. So those are the, the challenges that we have. And then, um, of course, initially when we started a company, our business plan was to sell, sell the first system after four years. And then we sold two systems after two years. So we, we have to change everything. Um, so that was, that was the experience that I had. Yes, and just being very adaptable to conditions and which customers come up and what their actual problems are. Yeah, excellent. <coughs> And uh, now we'll, we'll go to Nara Lee. So now we're moving down the value chain. Uh, you're in the market, at least in one market, and now you're, you're going to go global. So Nara Lee is a managing partner at Brainchild Partners, consulting and advisory boutique based in Seoul, Korea, and Hong Kong. And Nara, at Brainchild Partners, you focus on helping entrepreneurs and growth companies to scale and commercialize their technology globally. So, can you share an example of how this works in practice and what are some of the success factors and challenges and the typical time out, timeline for rollout? Oh, thanks for a really good Hi, everyone. Oh, my name is Nara. I'm from Seoul, South Korea. And what we do is basically, in a nutshell, we try to connect and collaborate and grow between the two parties, let's say, within Korean government or international companies together. So it's, we need to get this start a company to connect with the kind of value partners in terms of R&D or value chain generation in all aspects. So what we try to do is always try to get a support from the government side because without government support in the beginning stage, especially companies like tech startups, they cannot survive in a long term because they supposed to focus on what they are developing in a problem. And without sufficient funding from the government or grant, they're going to be saying, well, the, you know, having a hard time trying to figure out what to do with that. So as an example, about six, seven years ago, we started working for a small venture company, which developed the first, the world first portable hydro power plant is a size of like this. So what it is, is you go camping or adventure trip, and you run out of your bathroom in the mountains. And if you put this machine in a full water, and the, the spinning of the water and goes in, and it gives you a uh, kind of store about full generation into the attached battery. So when you have full charge, you get the battery result, you continue your journey, and then you could probably, you know, like charge two or 2.5 times in your mobile phone on the way in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the first companies that I worked together in a long time. And the first thing we did is in terms of uh, developing the product, we got the initial funding from an engine investor, about $100,000. And instead of having thinking too much within the lab, we decided to make a long uh, kind of camping trip in the US. We're trying to make as many camping site or mountain site as possible, trying to hear what the potential customer want in terms of the functions and features of the project. 
So after six months, we came back to Korea and we finished up our first prototype design. And then we did crowdfunding. That was when we hit in the global stage. And after that, the company gave a better condition in financially, and we were able to get second round funding or from the government. So even that time, you know, in Russia, I had a better position to give another stage of funding and uh, product development. Mm, okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, so let's, let's pause here because we covered a lot of ground, and I'm really curious to, to hear what's resonating and what questions you have. So I'll, I'll take uh, three questions from the audience. Please make them questions, real questions. Uh, does anybody have a question they'd like to address to any of the panelists? stories about startups uh, who started you know, uh, for five years and started to sell after five years. Uh, that means it equals to five years, six years, or seven years of development stage. I heard three stories about them. How did you manage this process? Uh, did you get any funding? Or uh, if, even if you, did, if you get funding, how did you manage the fund in five years, six years, without any sale, without any generating cash flow? I'm just curious about that. Uh, first thing, Mr. Gregman, and uh, these two gentlemen afterwards. Okay. Uh, our story may, it's a good question, our story may uh, differ from others because Bulut uh, Park has uh, started as a passion project by uh, two guys who are dealing with it in, in the weekend in addition to what they are doing as, as a professional business. Uh, it came to a point they worked or done and they work for the companies at the same time. And it came to a point that some companies, after years and years, some companies are approaching to uh, ask for products. Because I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give a, not a brief answer if I have time, I'll, give, I'll share uh, more brighter sense, more, more broader sense. Uh, and then companies that approach and ask for products, then we turn the passion project into a B2B software as a service business in, in a couple of months after uh, lots of, let's say, market research, some use case, investment. But before diving into details, I want to give a broader sense. Uh, I think it's going to resonate to what all gentlemen, ladies said in the, in the panel. Uh, let's say, Mm, we had an earthquake uh, this year in February uh, in a region that is covering Gaza and, and, and ten other cities, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Could we control it? Mm, to the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, but we could have controlled the impact. So this is how weather is today. I mean, you can't control the weather, but you can control the impact. What I'm saying is what we offer is a uh, very short, short, mid and long term adaptation for your business. I mean, if you are, let's say, you have a brand new car park outside, is, let's say, um, and a hail is coming in 20 minutes, then you get an SMS uh, or some alerts. Go park somewhere else because the hail is coming and it's going to damage your car in 20 minutes, 4 out of 5 risk. So, this is an action that can save money that can produce revenue or that can increase safety. Or if you are thinking for a, let's say, investment in bridges in, in uh, very, very mega projects, then you need to know what's going to come after 10 years rather than today. So it is, it is a vision. What, why I'm saying is uh, there has been a, a paradigm shift. In, in, in our area, in weather intelligence and climate change, as you experience each and every day, it is going crazy. I mean, 50% is the increased rate in uh, extreme weather incidents in our region in the last five years, 
currently the damage per day is around 1 billion by globally, by uh, extreme weather incidents. So, as, as, as Mr. Tan and uh, Mr. Batur Erdogan was, was mentioning two uh, valuable subjects for me, myself, one was convincing yourself so that you can convince others, and the other one was about uh, the, the, the future of quantum computing. What we are doing is we are collecting data as from observational sources and we make a forecast which is more precise, but the data points is increasing rapidly that you can collect data and processing power and the uh, uh, expensiveness of quantum computing or supercomputing is, is going very accessible. Then if you combine these two, then there has been a paradigm shift in weather that you can go longer, you can go cheaper, you can go more precise. So we want to catch it as, as group done. We want to catch it first and we want to drive it. A, a startup that is uh, going global from Turkey. And uh, if, if so, I may... Well, well, let's, let's go uh, on to uh, the other, another example yeah. from Nara. Yeah. So the question was about startup time and investment. Yeah. So did you, uh, did you give your answer? No. Uh, what, <laughs> uh, what we have done in terms of this subject is uh, we, we are three co-founders that has a solid background in corporate as well as previous successful startups, which are every one of us, let's say, successful. Uh, <laughs> And we come together and we have started to think of why before how and what after how. So we, we didn't dive into the subject, we didn't conclude at a glance. We just work on it. Why are we doing it? How are we going to do that and what we are going to do that? From that time onwards, we have lined up the use cases that is coming out of 10 sectors and we have try to eliminate them, we have tried to prioritize them, and we have went to the customers to understand how they are approaching, because we have solid assumptions for those use cases, and then we have convinced them that it can, it can work. Then we went to investors, uh, angels and VCs all around, not Turkey, and we have tried to convince them to raise money that has already awaiting customers to use it. Then uh, we, at least from some perspective, uh, we have made a good orchestration among team because it's 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 uh, like an interconnected uh, cyborg or organism, a company. So I see. So we have made a good orchestration, and uh, we have ne never stopped thinking unconstrained rather than asking for money, rather than asking for clients. And that all came up, I mean, it's not uh, a generic story, it's like uh, full of hard work and passion and like, motivation. Yeah, thank you. So again, just getting those customers uh, contracts yeah. and then using those as a way to raise funding. For sure. But the timeline was quite condensed from the passion project which started and then you incorporated in 2021. Yeah, it, was, it used to be very hard to work two subjects at once. Uh, one is a uh, passion that may create or may not create a business endeavor. It's not necessary to do that. If it's happening organically, then you can turn into a B2B business. And working at the same time, so it's hard, but uh, it gets harder. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you want to share briefly how, what the funding and situation was? Well, I could try to give some examples. In Korea, the central government in Korea, it's usually they allocate about $3 billion in the startup grant in terms of many different ideas. And it's run by a little bit over 100 government or government-led agencies in Korea. They provide over 400 different programs for startups every year. So I believe that when it comes to tech startups, when it comes to manufacturing product, when we can develop a new product, it takes a lot of time and energy. So I believe uh, I could recommend those companies to have good council members or advisors. We could have a pro bono basis, but still, that, so that the advisors can lead them to a stage where 
the company will be able to get an initial grant or funding from the government so they can have much more resources which they let them focus on what they're doing for the development instead of distracting themselves while looking. At the same time for the development, they have to think about the cash flow. But for me, it's always better for them to focus on what they're trying to develop in the first place instead of having you know, cash now or cash flow at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think the grant or funding in the beginning, either from public or private sector, would be a vital element in leading them for long term work. So I have a follow up question to that because, yes, it can be so helpful to have that government funding those grants, and it's often what helps deep technology survive. But it's also a double-edged sword. It can be a double-edged sword to have this government funding and not um, other sources of funding because there are restrictions that come with it. So have, what advice would you give in terms of managing how um, much grant funding you take, what kind, how long? I open this to the panel. Any thoughts on more government-oriented funding as a strategy? May I? If I may comment that, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely complex often. And uh, I have seen that it causes also problems. That, for example, in some countries where the governmental funding is quite significant, it also creates that companies are basically developing solutions that they know that uh, those people who decide to give the money are happy exactly. and, and they forget the market and they, they forget what, it, what is really needed, so that uh, if it, it's, it seems to be extremely complex to get work. I understand that especially if we talk about the really new science, uh, significant uh, research and that type of areas, it makes sense. But more we come to, um, could I say, uh, they ex existing technologies to offer services like something like that, somebody makes a new food delivery service. Uh, it, it, uh, I, I feel that uh, it's, it's more complex to, to have this type of instruments. Uh, so, so that uh, I, I feel much more in the, in the market, but I understand that in many countries you need also some governmental uh, instruments, but I would think that it would be better if they would work like normal investments or finance instruments, not like subsidies that are basically distributed by the government officers. Right. So can I show? Oh, so. Yes. Uh, well, I think that raising funds is, is a full-time job. You know, but it's very exhausting. So if, if you're thinking into founding a new company, which will need funding in the long run for many years, at least one of the, the Founding partners should be very, very good at a raising fund, like having the, the emotional, the emotional intelligence into into getting those funds in. Because uh, most founders, they, they will fund into the people and, and not into the company, not even in, into the idea they will present. Because the, the first idea will be a grasp of, of the company. We will have to give it into half. So. Uh, I think that, that you have one, at least one, of, of, of the, the members of the team focus into that and liberate all the others into focus into the product. Well, yeah, do you have a thought on, because I care this thing has... Startups 
So if they give you a lot of uh, pay stubs uh, without asking back for much, or give you a loan that probably has 20 years of repayment, and the interest is probably 1% or something like that. Um, so those are the things you should aim for uh, as a, as a, if you have a startup. And to answer your questions earlier about uh, you know what about fundraising and all these things, I think you need to have a very solid business plan, right? So you get a business plan there, and then you see, okay, like for our case, we say, okay, in four years we're going to sell a quantum computer, and these are the money we need, right? So you manage that based on the business plan. And if you go to government funding, just have a really good project plan. Like what are you going to do with the money? And then when you do see, you know, of course there are a lot of external forces. You always plan for ten years, but it's not going to happen. And if you have external forces that say, oh, okay, suddenly you get a business in two years, you just have to go to your back to the drawing board, you know, change everything, and then go to the board, go to the you know, your financiers and stuff, telling them, okay, do you want this opportunity or not? This is if you don't take it, you have opportunity cost. So typically, the investors will be really willing to invest more just to make things happen. So this is how we deal with it. Uh, so I can, I can make a comment yes, about the government funding. Yes, and I have uh, lots of experience about the government funding uh, for all my projects. I can say all my projects. But first, what I again, uh, I have to suggest something. First, you have to take your funding from the private sector or private customer or clients and start with them. And the government funding is a flavor of the new cash flow for you in the second or third round. If you start with the innovation uh, government funding, generally what I saw uh, from the other projects, you are spending too, too many, much time for uh, filling the documents and uh, trying to explain yourself, your expenses, what it means, and uh, your energy is going there. And but as an entrepreneur, as a project owner, you have to focus your products and solutions uh, with your passions, and you, you spend your uh, time uh, on, on for, for your products. Uh, instead of losing your time with the policies and documents and everything. But I strongly suggest, please use the government funding, supporting funding, in the second round, second stage, third stage motion. That's a great point, because I, I actually have a client right now who has a potential client who could get government funding to pay for their service. But my client doesn't want to do all the paperwork and all the admin and all the all the, the reports that they're going to have to make. So there's this very difficult balancing act between you know do you take the cash now and pay for it later, or or how do you manage all those different sources? So it's not an easy it's not an easy question, and I think it also depends on what kind of technology or service you have. Maybe I can read some comment as well. I'm not saying the government funding is not important. Uh, this, is, right. this is important. Uh, the governments are playing a very important role for this startup generation and uh, for community uh, moving uh, in a better way. Uh, we all have to use the uh, government funds and also we have to push and convince the government agencies and the politicians to make these stronger policies and laws and regulations uh, to change the society in, in a healthy way, I can say. They are playing a very important role because they are making the, uh, the law and regulations. It's, it's very important. If the, there are any audience from the governments, this works uh, to them because we are talking, discussing about the earthquakes and and something like that. All of the regulation is related with the politicians and the governments, I can yes. say. Yeah. So, for example, what I believe is uh, the after the earthquake in Turkey, the ten thousands of buildings will be renewed and will be uh, rebuilt again. All of these new buildings can, for example, generate their own electricity without plugging the uh, electricity infrastructure. This, this, is, this is very easy indeed if 
the governments and the politicians will change the regulations and laws, I am 100% sure engineers and scientists will make it within a five to 10 years. So we will uh, not need any electricity infrastructure, even if cars. Uh, in, in, in the previous uh, um, discussions, uh, there are several uh, car factory uh, CEO uh, spoke about electric cars. And what I strongly suggest them, uh, they can change their car products, uh, create their own energy by themselves instead of plugging to uh, electricity infrastructure. Again, it is doable. We all know this, this is doable. We don't have to use the wind uh, or hydroelectrics or nuclear, nuclear power plants and, uh, for generating the electricity. Right. And so governments can be a force for good if they put in the incentives to incentivize certain behaviors. That's how yeah. we keep it. If I can make one comment, actually one way, uh, actually link very much what you said that I, I see is a very good way for governments to work is that they actually uh, buy purchase things from startup companies. Yes. And it's something that I think that many governments could make much more. I, I think quantum computing in your case is actually one example that the governmental organization has actually bought something. And of course, if we think traditionally, for example, in the US and for example in Israel, one important part has been the military that has actually uh, purchased quite a lot of new technologies from uh, tech companies and it has been actually very important for the many, many companies and I think that it is healthier way than basically that you fill a lot of applications and, uh, and then you try to, to get the money for free. I think that is a great point, yes. Uh, yeah, something. Many times you, you get the funds from the government and you run out of funds and you, you don't get it from, from the private sector. But then you're, you're really sure about what your idea is and, and your company are confident about that. And you, you, you will let it die. So you do everything for, for it to success, like doing things that you want to do in the first place, like getting hours of consultancy or something like that until you get the traction. To, to your company, if, you, if you're really convinced about what you're doing and, and that is a good idea and, and it, it has to be a place in the market for that, and you do everything for, the, for that, and that means doing a lot of things that you didn't want to do in the first place or, or, or even yes. you wasn't convinced of doing that. Right, we're kind of speaking in the ideal world, right, where it's as if you have these options that you can just choose, but often you're fighting for survival and you don't have that, that freedom. Short comment just uh, came up in my mind after I answered. Sorry. Uh, the reason maybe I uh, took the question in a different sense is 99% uh, of the cases of the entrepreneurs uh, see investment as the blockage mm -hmm. to make something uh, real. And investment is only related to money. But I mean, 90% of the cases maybe can start with hundreds of, couple of hundreds of K. And you can find uh, money anywhere for, for such money. But it's rather like, if you, let's say we got an investment from a tech giant C-level executive in the United States as angel investor, and we just got a uh, global VC fund. And it's rather about who you wanna work with, rather than whose money are you taking. So it's a partnership rather than uh, uh, extracting money. And the second thing uh, is, is uh, it is a process, as he, as he very well mentioned, it's a full-time process. And the reason it's becoming a full-time process is it's improving. Outcome extraction, of, let's say, the investment is the outcome, but the procedure is something that improves you very much for the areas that you have never looked at the areas that you have never think of because someone is showing up and he or she wants to earn like 10x, 100x with your investment. So you want to convince them the commercialization part, yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. And that actually, I have a point to add on to that. So I, as I mentioned, I write about corporate startup collaboration. And often, uh, startups feel like they have to do everything the corporate wants, right? The corporate is this big giant. They have the power. They have the money. And in fact, um, they need to make sure they balance the power dynamic because they have something very valuable, their technology, their ability to innovate and move fast. And so startups can go to corporates as sort of an equal partner, as you said, as a partnership, as a, as a someone that they can work with together, not someone that there's, is just going to make demands and they're going to acquiesce to all their demands. So um, I'm, on, I'm coaching those startups to take a stand and say, no, we really um, believe our technology is valuable. If you don't want it, then we'll go somewhere else where it is. Where it is uh, and, and many times in corporate, uh, they have all, all this, you know, this paperwork and, and all, all this hard, all these things that you have to fill or fulfill before you, they, they even contract yes. you. And, and they were thinking for for a grown-up company, and many startups can't afford even afford to do that. No. And so many corporates now they are starting to to get a special, you know, like. Plugging for for them for startups, uh, taking into consideration just like for for doing contracts with them uh -huh. with, with special terms, uh, yeah. knowing that a startup can, yeah okay, may fail that startup. Oh, they're can, waiting. Yeah. Yes. So I've seen many stories where startups were able to negotiate maybe a dedicated project manager, or not to have three meetings every week to give them an update. So you need to negotiate for these terms so that you can survive and produce the technology. Yes, a question. Thank you. I'm happy that there is no echo. Right, so I wanted to ask uh, a few questions that will be popping up while we are talking. So I have a question to Victor about uh, the case that you mentioned in Uruguay, the company that was doing the testing. Do you think that this growth is sustainable and can they go and expand beyond Uruguay branch off because I think that it's going to die out, right? The, the COVID, I mean, everyone says could come back, could, could not, but it's not a sustainable business model to rely on to hope that there will be thousands of people coming for testing. So are they doing anything to branch out, to expand? How they use this windfall to develop so this one thing? Another question I have for you is that you mentioned that you have to have a dedicated person for negotiating. We are having actually extended tomorrow first discussions for our first round of funding. Me being the founder of Pushing on my own bootstrapping for a year and a half. And I have technical people who can talk to other people as good as uh, a pet could. So they have no social skills. So I'm doing everything, everything but coding, even though I can do that as well. So I'm dedicated to the funding rounds, I'm dedicated to the product, I'm dedicated to this and to everything else. So which part of me should I dedicate <laughs> to negotiate <laughs> with the... <laughs> yes, right. So, uh, so these are my questions. And um, I had a few more, but I don't want to keep too long because there's eight minutes left. So Let's I'll start with those. Yeah. Let's start with those. So uh, regarding the first one, um, I think that what, once you grow it, Fast enough, then you have to give it the idea. You know, like if you want to uh, survive because COVID is no longer there. But you get the strength into building new stuff or ideas that you have in, in, in your wardrobe. You can pull up and, and start building upon that, and that means uh, getting into new markets. I don't know where they are going right now. Uh, and I think that they they are getting into Brazil and some other countries to, to gain traction and market because they, now they can do it. Uh, in the past they don't have the money to do that or, or, or at least they prove that they could do that and, and grow at, at a rate that uh, can investors want to, to invest into them. And, and the second question is, uh, in my case, I, uh, my company is struggling from the south so I, I, and they have rounds of investment. So uh, um, this is something that I get from, from, from other companies. And it's good for you to do everything. I, I've been doing everything in my company for, 
for the first like five years, I think all the sea level and, and doing all the stuff. I think it's, it's something that happens to most of entrepreneurs. Uh, you just need to have the, 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 the skills to do that. You know, many times you, don't, you just don't have the skills. You, uh, many times you're focusing to product and you're good at making a product, but you don't have the skills of, of a talking person. So maybe in that, in that case, it's you, you need to, to have somebody that uh, has the skills that you don't have. You know, you, you have to, to know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And then look for somebody to, to cover your, your business. Maybe this in, in, in operation, you know, you have the skill for operation, you're very good entrepreneur, you have good ideas, but, but then operating your assessor or, or, or maybe talking into to investor or something like that. But, uh, finding out that it's very important to know what your strengths are and your weakness. Was your question also about how to allocate your energy and time and for all these different roles? Yes, and exactly. That's what I meant. Uh, energy and time. I, well, I'm lucky not to have flaws. No, I'm joking. So I, I can do a lot of the things that I'm doing. So I'm managing just that I don't have the time. And yes. I don't get to sleep much. And I would like to get another person on the team. But I would hate to get another person just so that they can close a deal with the investor. Because that would feel a bit kind of like, not cheating, but like you, we've been doing pushing for a year and a half, and then suddenly someone goes, "Okay, I did it," and you're on the team. So I'm just thinking, like, at what point do I get a person? At what point? How do I dedicate my time? How do I dedicate my? This is a question I'm asking myself every day. Do I do the product? Oh, I didn't do the product for a whole week. My 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 developers are knocking on my door, so then I have to also have meetings. Like people are waiting for meetings. Mm -hmm. So this is a big puzzle. Like the time and the organization part is like. I'm thinking about the cost of time that's fine. Okay. So, well, as a coach, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Happy to talk with you after. <laughs> um, so, it is a very tricky tightrope. I mean, in the beginning, how many people are on your team? Five. Right. So, you can't be specialized, you can't have dedicated anything or anyone. Um, but as the CEO, which I believe you are, uh, your main job is to keep the cash flow coming and make sure that there's fuel for the, the engine to, to, to move. So I think what I see with a lot of startup founders, they think they don't have a lot of time, but they actually have more time and energy than they realize because they are wasting energy in, in certain ways. So, so you can also train your team how to bring you problems and solutions. So I think there are just tiny little things that you could be doing that would open up these little um, pockets of space and, and time for you. But at the end of the day, your job is to keep the lights on and make sure there's, there's fuel for, for the machine. So prior towards there, you clear, make sure that everybody's clear on what they're doing. And you'd be surprised. People can solve more problems than they realize when they take full ownership. If, if I can very quickly comment also, my experience is that it's very difficult to, could I say, outsource fundraising, <laughs> including also that you have to find a new person to take care of that in your company. And there are also so many advisors who would like to offer some services to you and they are making a lot of name dropping how they have talked with different investors. But often it doesn't work in that way. And for example, when I talk with startups uh, as, as an investor, I actually like to talk with uh, founders and those people who are, who are really doing things, not a kind of external person or somebody who is coming later says to make a fancy story to the investors. I, I, I like much more the real story. Yes, I agree, in the beginning. But I, but I was told well, I was telling that one of the founders should be uh, related to, to getting the, the founding done, not somebody from the outside. Right. Yeah, that's right. the idea. Ideally, the idea was it was it's it's not the, so easy to do all of us. Yeah. On a practical note, I've heard founders using ChatGPT to do more of their research, <laughs> and so you can be using AI as an assistant. Yeah. So I think our time is is up. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank our panel for all the, the diverse perspectives. I hope you have some ideas now of how you can go out there and, and manage these very tricky situations. So 
thanks for coming to our panel. Thank you. Tomorrow, uh, please uh, fill it and leave on your desk.